Thank you. Uh, there we go. So I thought I'd first just introduce myself uh, and expand on Alex's introduction. So my name is Lauren Windus. I'm a registered nutritionist, naturopath. I'm also author of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Your Route to, to Recovery, and also the co-founder of Ardere, uh, which is a holistic wellbeing brand. So we comprise of a wellness and nutrition clinic and also a self-care product range. Uh, so I have a one-to-one -one practice uh, based in Knightsbridge in London, but also obviously an online digital practice as well, which definitely makes up the boatload of my clients. And I specialize in bespoke personalized nutrition. So obviously areas, passion areas for me is chronic fatigue syndrome and of course long COVID. Uh, and that actually kind of is the background for how I got into nutrition and well-being. So back in 2012, when I was at university studying English, um, I essentially became unwell with a viral infection. And it was a classic kind of never been well since scenario. So um, I experienced obviously that myself of chronic fatigue syndrome and then slowly putting the jigsaw puzzle pieces back together of my ill health and um, I'm obviously hugely passionate about working with clients in this area myself. Uh, I also deal with gut health issues, weight management, hormonal thyroid problems, as well as eating disorders and see that also kind of extends into autoimmunity, especially with the, the CFS on COVID side. Um, and yeah, so today, obviously, we're going to be talking a little bit about a case study overview of mine. Uh, this is my client, Richard. It's not actually him. I have given him an alias, um, but I've also found the stock image of, of, a, of a Richard. Um, and so I talked to you, I'll tell you a little bit about Richard's case, first of all. So he's a 55 year old male um, university lecturer. He's married with one child, still living in the in the parental home, and he has a predominantly plant-based diet. So occasionally eating a couple of animal products here and there, but predominantly uh, a fan of being plant-based. And he caught COVID uh, back in December of 2022 and had been struggling with a never been well since scenario. Um, he obviously a university lecturer, but had been on and off work due to his poor health. And he came to see me back in April um, as a result of this experience and he wasn't working at the time. So he pretty much signed off um, his lecturing uh, and work at the university. And, and so his main symptoms, uh, fatigue, of course, um, I've highlighted here in yellow, his two kind of cardinal symptoms, which were his main concerning things he really wanted to address. Um, so those being fatigue, uh, sorry, post-exertional malaise. Post-exertional malaise is very much a hallmark symptom of chronic fatigue syndrome. It's essentially where your symptoms and fatigue, but a lot of the other kind of CFS symptoms that are going on, they essentially feel worse or exacerbate as a result of activity or pus pushing past your threshold. Um, the other symptom he was really looking to address was brain fog, but also in the background, he had dizziness, light and sound sensitivity, um, and in April, he was also given a diagnosis of post-COVID CFS ME. Um, also, his favourite hobby was running, um, and he was really keen to get back to that. Um, he'd in the past done marathons, uh, so he was very active. Um, and it felt as though, especially when I was speaking to him, that there was a resistance to his situation, as though you know he was really struggling with the fact that he wasn't able to do what he previously was able to do. Uh, so quite rightly, there was a lot of frustration there, uh, but it felt like he was resisting what was going on with him, but really kind of wanting to get back fighting fit as soon as possible. Um, so our initial consultation together. So we first of all sat down, had a thorough health assessment. I asked him to complete a food diary, um, just a seven day window, of just looking day to day at what he was eating, just to get a bit of a blueprint and an understanding. Um, we did a QA and a on his, on his symptoms, but also all, all the different systems in his body in terms of what was going on, what was his health history looking like, family history, um, diet and lifestyle. And then we requested some GP tests, um, so full blood count, full iron profile, things like thyroid. I know they don't fully investigate everything when it comes to our th thyroid hormones, but it was good just to get an overview and as well ruling out potential causes of anemias like B12 and folate. Um, then we um, just to kind of overview the ante antecedents to his case. So he had had a stressful time at work prior to becoming unwell. So there was a conflict with his boss 
Um, and also he'd had vestibular issues. He'd been diagnosed with something called vestibular hypofunction. And um, so there were a few balance issues going on. And then of course the trigger event was this COVID infection back in December of last year. Um, and the things that I very much kind of thought were the mediators of what was going on was, uh, as I say, there was this resistance. There was, a, it felt like there was a lot of stress that was kind of coming into the mix, but also this resistance to accept what was going on was very much fighting it. Um, which I don't think was doing any good in the in the situation, uh, but also high ultra processed food intake and also high sugar intake uh, was also occurring, and was unaware of the the concept of pacing. That's something we're going to discuss later on uh, in terms of his activity levels. And also, whilst he had um, ended, you know, obviously he wasn't at work for the fact that he was on sickness leave. He was still because he was a university lecturer, but he worked in construction, so lecturing on construction and building and he would still go into certain construction sites and as some of these kind of work visits when his health was in a little bit of a better place so he'd kind of be frequently going in and that's kind of got me thinking okay potentially is there pollution here as well that he could be exposed to so I thought I'd just do a slide to give you a bit of a background on chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so first of all, CFS, um, it's a complex chronic illness and it significantly impacts the lives of those who experience it. So it impacts various different systems of the body. So we know that it impacts our neuroendocrine system, so that's kind of like our hormone systems, our nervous system, our immune system, and our digestive systems. And the evidence is suggesting that there is a dysregulation between these systems, and that is helping to explain why we have this complex picture of, of symptoms seen in this illness. So I've listed some of the kind of common symptoms here, as I mentioned earlier, post-exertional malaise, fatigue, of course, but also feeling flu-like, so kind of frequently catching colds and infections, um, also static intolerance, which is where symptoms worse, worsen upon standing, um, dizziness, nausea, brain fog, food and alcohol intolerance. We also see gut issues, which very much resemble those of IBS, um, like noise sensitivity, muscle pains. So as you can see, CFS is way more than just feeling tired all the time. It can be hugely debilitating. And a lot of people obviously get signed off work as a result of that experience um, and really struggle to uh, function on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have seen other names uh, throughout the history with CFS. Obviously, CFS gets clunked in with ME, uh, so myalgic encephalomyelitis, uh, also post-viral fatigue syndrome, uh, and even was informally referred to as yucky flu back in the 80s uh, when it was seen widespread around 20 to 30-year-old professionals. But doesn't mean to say that if you're 20, if you're not 20 or 30 years old that you aren't going to you know potentially become unwell with CFS because it can affect any age category. Um, obviously long COVID has recently come into the mix as well um, and gained prominence especially after people were becoming unwell with um, actually often mild infections of COVID. Um, so it's almost, it almost kind of seemed to be a lot of people who weren't hospitalized um, with COVID but dealing with it at home but then also reporting this classic never been well since scenario with the symptoms very much mirroring CFS and obviously this is kind of what we're seeing in Richard's case where he's had this diagnosis of post-COVID CFS ME um, and obviously whilst experts are still researching both of these especially long COVID has had a lot of funding in recent years uh, there is a substantial overlap between the two uh, but we can't say as to yet if this is, you know, long COVID and CFS are distinct conditions from one another. Uh, but obviously the research is hopefully providing much more insight uh, so we can bolster our understanding of, you know, CFS, long COVID and whether these are all part of the same picture or different expressions of something similar. So chronic fatigue syndrome background, just to kind of talk a bit about the root causes. So first of all, in a nutshell, we don't actually know what the sole cause of CFS is. Uh, but what we can do is we can see that CFS follows a three-pronged structure. So that involves, a, first of all, predisposition. So we do have some evidence now and some ongoing studies looking into the genetic links that predispose people to becoming unwell with CFS. Um, so we also have a UK-based study called the Decode ME study, and that's looking at the genetic links. We've also got twin studies looking into the genetic predispositions. Uh, so we know that that can form part of the parcel of people potentially being predisposed to becoming unwell with it. 
And then we have this precipitating trigger. Um, and that is that kind of straw that broke the camel's back scenario. Um, you know, things like infections, whether it's COVID, um, Epstein-Barr virus, sometimes it can be bacterial or parasitic. Uh, for other cases, it might be surgery uh, or even in some, certain cases, vaccinations, um, traumatic or stressful life events such as a car accident, a fall or even a bereavement. So almost where, and this doesn't always happen, but in a large majority of cases, and a lot of people that come to see me, there's always this classic, I've not been well since X. Um, and then what we see is that third P, and that's what I like to call the perpetuating factors. And these are the root drivers that have been essentially studied and correlated at the heart of CFS. So, so clinically, when I'm working with CFS case, cases, it's about unpicking the mo mosaic of fatigue with each of my clients to discover kind of what chronic stresses might be present within this picture. And you can see that on the table here. Um, and this is this concept of dysregulation uh, where the systems become out of balance and we can see potentially deficiencies or toxicity. And it might be the case that a client presents with multiple on these uh, within this table, or it might be just one or two uh, uh, kind of specifically driving what's going on. But obviously this is where testing can be really useful. Um, so obviously, what did I recommend as next steps? Well, that was uh, the Genova chronic fatigue screen test, which is obviously what we're going to be talking about today. So first of all, what is the CFS screen test? Well, it's two tests in one. Um, it's an adrenal stress profile, uh, which obviously measures your uh, body's uh, cortisol, so your body's major stress hormones, but it also looks at another hormone, which is another stress hormone called DHEA. Um, and this is also has the option for a cortisol awakening response add-on. Um, and then the, the chronic fatigue screen test also has um, the organic acid test, which is called the organics, uh, which we're going to go into. So knowing what I do, obviously, about CFS and this kind of picture of perpetuating factors, these root drivers that we've now seen in various studies and clinical evidence that actually potentially can be the driving factors of what's going on and what can be underpinning cohorts of people going uh, becoming unwell with CFS. This is where testing can come in. In Richard's case, obviously, we're seeing this chronic stress picture. Uh, the fact that he doesn't tolerate stress particularly well, which he reported to me, but also just from sitting down with him in our initial consultation and seeing how stressed he was about the situation, which quite rightly so is, is very natural to be in that scenario when your health isn't great. Um, but also it's just part of you know me understanding, okay, what could be going on in his case on a functional level? So that's where I thought, okay, this is where we definitely want to look at his adrenals uh, and really assess cortisol. Um, and of course, as well with the, with the viral trigger, it was suspected that with, there were these cellular stresses uh, and potentially that pollution exposure as well. So we're looking at things like the mitochondria, any nutrient insufficiencies, inflammation and oxidative or toxic stresses um, to assess obviously organic acid. So that's why for me, this was a really sensible option to recommend to Richard. Um, and again, just to say, you know, when it comes to dealing with CFS clients, you know, functional testing, it gives us insight into the health of a client's functional systems. And this is really useful for looking at these biochemical imbalances when dealing with complex, unexplained medical illnesses. And really doing tests like these provide us with a pathway for personalization. So we can reference these chronic stresses and we can actually target things based on an individual case. And this is where personalization is, is a huge, huge part of, of what I do in clinic. Um, and other tests that also might have been useful in Richard's case that were worth considering was obviously the GI effects test to look at if there's any GI infections going on, dysbiosis, um, a thyroid plus panel to look at T3 levels and assess autoimmunity, and also potentially an elemental analysis to really screen blood levels of heavy metals and his minerals too. So let's run through the results. Okay, so this was Richard's cortisol um, or adrenal stress profile, I did actually choose to run the add-on, which was the cortisol awakening response here. And essentially the cortisol awakening response gives us an immediate awakening cortisol measurement. So that's kind of the first time he wakes up in the morning and then we see an immediate um, result 30 minutes after that. 
Uh, so what we really want to see is, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, fingers crossed you can, but we really want to see um, a measurement will arise in cortisol dramatically increasing from 50% or more. And that would be a healthy cortisol response. Now, in Richard's case, what we can see here is minus 42%. So that is indicating a low cortisol awakening response. It means he's not mounting that kind of daily stress resilience response, um, which indicates that there might be a loss of ability to respond to stresses um, and a lack of stress resiliency. Now, that third result, 7.67, which is also charted on his salivary cortisol, which is the normal uh, part of the adrenal stress profile test without the add-on. And we can see this um, here. Uh, we can see again he's borderline elevated and then between 11 and 1 he actually is mounting a cortisol response um, at some point throughout the day which again is showcasing that we've got kind of this we've not really got any cortisol happening in the morning and really what we're meant to be seeing is this elevated triangle when we're talking about a cortisol awakening response uh, where it should kind of start here rise in the morning to its peak within 30 minutes and then start to kind of stagger off um, and taper off obviously into the evening times. So what we're seeing here is that he has this dysregulated cortisol pattern. And if this kind of goes on, if the elevations and the dysregulations can go on for a long time, we can see this flattening of cortisol where no cortisol is produced at all throughout the day. And that's where we get this hypocortisolemia. Um, interestingly, that 11 to 1 p.m. rise that's kind of way out of reference range could also be related to blood sugar dysregulation. And that's quite interesting when we look at the organic acids results um, later on on the next couple of slides. So that's something what I obviously definitely bore in mind when I was looking at his results. Um, and the other thing to say as well is that when it comes to cortisol, obviously being our major stress hormone, it also has a catabolic effect on our tissues. So it's very much a wear and tear effect on our body systems. So obviously when we're, we're dealing with issues with cortisol dysregulation, especially when it can be high, such as you know, in the middle of the day or even in the evening times, potentially uh, dysregulating his sleep cycle. Um, it's having this wear and tear and this inflammatory effect. Uh, but DHEA has almost like, if you think of them like yin and yang, uh, DHEA obviously being that counterbalancing, um, it was has anti-inflammatory because it's an anabolic hormone. So it kind of builds up from the destructive effects that have been caused from cortisol. But actually Richard's results, you can see 0 0.07 um, and DHEA to cortisol ratio is 0 0.01. So very much on the low side. And um, so it's just important to kind of consider there that, you know, maybe with his stress, his lack of stress resiliency, stress is definitely part of the picture. He's not mounting that car response in the morning, but also he's he's not really having that kind of counterbalancing effect happening from DHEA. So that's definitely something we would look to address. Um, but let's just look through the organic acid tests first and we can get a full picture before I move on to talking about his protocol. Um, so first of all, organic acids, these are metabolic byproducts which accumulate in our urine and they provide insights into various areas of our cellular and functional health. So here we can see Richard's scores. He's got two yellows. They um, indicate a moderate need for clinical support. And he's got one green, um, which is kind of a minimal need to, for support. But in, in terms of kind of what that showcasing, it, it's essentially from the algorithm that we're seeing within the organic acids test, uh, pulling all that data through onto this kind of main page, um, showcasing which areas we need to address the most. Obviously, it's looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, toxic exposure and methylation imbalance. So first of all, we have this kind of overview page. And again, this is pulling through the results of the organic acids into this nutrient needs score. Um, so here, interestingly, the first thing I wanted to actually flag up here was that the glutathione marker, whilst the algorithm you know, doesn't show a need for it here, on the following slides, when we look at some of the other organic acid um, analytes, there actually is a need for glutathione in Richard's case, which I will explain why. However, what we can see is that there's a need for well, an increased cellular demand for B vitamins. Obviously, they are key, key energy producers. So we know that just how important B vitamins are when it comes to supporting the mitochondria to do their job in creating energy and ATP, uh, which is our, essentially our little energy molecule within our cells. Um, also, magnesium was really important to kind of consider here. 
manganese and also we're showing up that there is a need for GI support here as well so digestive enzymes and a recommendation for probiotics too. So the citric acid cycle so first of all well this is kind of like your Krebs cycle so it's looking at your metabolism and how you're breaking down your macronutrients this one isn't actually looking at proteins because we've done the organics test uh, you can do the add-on to look at amino acids um, but this is a pathway chart that allows us to visualize backups in cellular metabolism um, via those macronutrients being broken down, those fats and those carbs, um, and being broken down into energy. So we can therefore see what nutrient needs could be in underpinning mitochondrial dysfunction. So we can see adipic and seborrheic acid. Um, so these are high analytes coming off the fatty acids. So this is these two red markers here. Um, and it showcases that we are unable to get the, um, these kind of fatty acids into our mitochondria to be broken, to be broken down, sorry, in a process called beta oxidation. And so what do we need for this to happen? Well, we need magnesium and vitamin B2 uh, to really help those fats to get into the mitochondria to help smooth this process along. So because we're seeing elevated levels of this market, these markers, that suggests that there's a clinical need to support with these nutrients. Um, in terms of other kind of things that were flagging on the red, well, first of all, there's the beta hydroxybutyric acid, and this is a ketone body. Uh, and I thought this was very, very interesting because Richard, well, this would be normal if we had somebody that was eating a ketogenic diet, it would be very normal to see elevated levels of this ketone body. Uh, but in his case, he, first of all, he doesn't have a keto diet. He actually has, you know, a very high carbohydrate diet. Uh, which could indicate poor glucose control in his scenario and we can also might see this high ketone body if he was doing endurance sports but of course with his health where it is at the moment he's not doing that so that leads me to kind of suspect potentially blood sugar issues going on um isocitric acid uh, which is here uh, so this one is part of the citric acid cycle so you can see again there's some elevated markers as well here, cis acid, I can never say them, cis acinic acid, uh, cisinic acid, oops, and malic acid. Um, so those are showcasing needs for certain nutrients uh, within this circle. The isocitric, we can see there's demands for B3, magnesium, and manganese, but also these, some of these can be inhibited by heavy metals as well, um, some of these pathways. So it's also worth considering that as part of the clinical picture. Okay, so moving on, uh, this page can be quite overwhelming to look at, uh, but this essentially is an overview of various different markers of the organic acids. Um, you can first see that we have these uh, malabsorption markers, and these are tracking, both of them actually are tracking within the red reference range, so tracking high. These are metabolites produced from bacterial fermentation of amino acids, and it's ind indicating that potentially Richard isn't necessarily absorbing nutrients, specifically protein from his diet, um, and that there's some kind of gut issues potentially at play there. Um, and this is also kind of correlated with and, and bolstered with the results we're seeing here for the dysbiosis markers too. Uh, so you can see, again, a lot of these tracking within the heart, uh, the red reference range. Um, this, with the dysbiosis markers, these can also be influenced by a diet that's high in flavonoids or polyphenols. Uh, so things like berries, fruits, cherries, or things like red wine. Um, so the fact that, first of all, I know that his diet was not high in those types of foods, uh, which, and obviously we know that a gold standard would be to run potentially a GI effect stool test to really kind of bolster that. But it gives us an insight that actually potentially there is a strong you know, link of dysbiosis going on here. And also his D-arabinitol is high and that also could be um, showcasing the presence of candida species too. Um, so that just gives us an insight as to potentially what his gut health is looking like. Um, the cellular energy and mitochondrial markers, these are looking at essentially what we've just seen on the previous page. So the adipic and seborrheic acid what we previously saw as um, as to those analytes that were basically stopping um, that, that kind of beta oxidation process. Um, this is our ketone body and uh, isocitric acid, again, which is also impeding the functioning of the mitochondria uh, and indicating the need for certain nutrients such as B vitamins. Uh, the vitamin markers um, on the following side of the page, 
these are, again, this is how we've created this algorithm, which we saw two slides ago, uh, which is showcasing, again, why there's a need for certain different nutrients. But specifically here, we're seeing a strong case for B7, uh, which is biotin. And then neurotransmitter metabolites. So this is the kynurenine markers, and they come from a tryptophan pathway. Uh, so we see quinolinic acid, uh, and this is, first of all, that's the 9.5 there that you're looking at. I don't think I circled that one. Oh, no, I did. <laughs> um, and that one has inflammatory and neurotoxic aspects. Now, that could potentially point us to some explanation as to why he's seeing these cognitive um, symptoms. Uh, it could be part of that picture. And obviously, when we look at the kynurenic and quinolinic ratio, again, that is showcasing this kind of strong inflammatory picture going on, that there is inflammation happening within his system um, within that result. So that's a very, very interesting and key one to flag up. Um, his serotonin markers, so 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid, that's a breakdown product of serotonin. Um, it can be high if a client's taking um, antidepressant medication, like SSSRIs, you can never say it, SSRIs. <laughs> um, and potentially, I mean, he's not taking any of those. In his scenario, I think this is correlated to the fact that he has dysbiosis. Uh, because obviously we know that a large majority of serotonin can be produced uh, within the gut uh, from gut bacteria. So we think potentially that could be connected to that dysbiosis score. Um, and then when it comes to the toxin and detox markers, well, firstly, we're seeing pyroglutamic acid being elevated. Um, so this is a sign that we need more glutathione in the body, and it shows that the body might be struggling with oxidative stress and that the body is using up glutathione at a much higher rate than usual. Um, so this is kind of our indicator that actually the body does need some uh, glutathione to support itself. And we're also seeing elevated markers. They're not quite in the red reference range, um, but we are seeing some within the yellow here, so tracking rather high. Um, this one is alpha ketophenolacetic acid from styrene, so that comes from plastics. So potentially he's exposed to plastics within the home or with, whether that was at work. Um, erotic, uh, sorry, alpha hydroxy isobutyric acid um, is indicating uh, potentially petrochemicals pollution, exhaust fume, things like that. So again, that might be related to the fact that he's frequently visiting these construction sites um, and whether there's any environmental exposure happening there. Um, erotic acid is slightly elevated and that could be a sign of potential liver strain. Um, and so I thought that was quite interesting just to kind of see a clinical picture and actually throughout that whole page, you're seeing various different avenues as to his functional health and the different imbalances that we're seeing, which is helping to build up this picture of what could be going on on a biochemical and a cellular level. So with regards to oh, the next, the other part of the test that I didn't actually screenshot and put on the slides was the oxalate markers or the creatinine. Uh, these markers were all fine, um, but they kind of sometimes, the oxalate markers can give us in insights on kidney stone risk and um, creatinine is very much a calibration marker for the test. So I didn't put those on there. Um, but those those were all kind of tracking within reference range, so that was all good. Um, this is the urine lipid, lipid peroxides, um, you can never say it, um, and it's showcasing, these are a class of free radicals that specifically damage fats. So they basically can showcase cell membrane damage um, and can be generated by environmental toxins, heavy metals, for example, even dysbiosis, stress, poor sleep, or problems with blood sugar. So it's really looking to kind of address all the factors that could be driving this. So he's tracking very high there, which is suggesting to me that, you know, he has some damage to those cellular membranes. Um, and obviously, you know, toxic stress could be a huge part of that picture. Uh, so we really need to consider supporting that. So how did this test help Richard? Well, first of all, we ran through the tests the test results together and it really helped validate and it gave him peace of mind as well because it helped him to see okay we do have some things to address here there is something going on that are currently driving my situation so the clinical picture which i've just listed here is first of all we can't neglect the fact that there's the covid trigger so suspected chronic viral activation um, dysregulated cortisol from what, from what we've seen on that um, adrenal stress profile. So we're seeing high levels at parts throughout the day, but also a low morning response. 
uh, which also correlated with the fact that he really struggled to get himself going first thing in the morning. Um, low DHEA, so lacks that anti-inflammatory capability uh, to counterbalance that cortisol's wear and tear effect. And then also nutrient antioxidant deficiencies, which are underpinning mitochondrial dysfunction. We're seeing gut issues at play, dysbiosis, malabsorption, poor blood sugar control, we're seeing, we're seeing that keto body there, um, chronic inflammation uh, with the quinolinic acid, and potentially this high oxidative stress and toxic load. Um, which also showcases that we have damage to his cellular membranes, which obviously we really need to keep those functioning as best they can because we see energy is all being created within the cells. And if there's damage to those cells, then obviously that's going to be part of the picture of fatigue as well. So this is all feeding into what I like to call the jigsaw of chronic fatigue syndrome, because we know it's complex, but these give us avenues to look towards and really help to give us this personalized protocol for Richard as an individual. So essentially my protocol that I went in with him what, with was, um, was a list of different supplements. Now, when it comes to supplementation, um, the goal is always to never have you know, somebody on supplements forever. Um, and often the case is you know, when I get clients coming to me with CFS, you know, a lot of them are on 20 supplements and it's a huge, huge list. I try to kind of stay away from like recommending more than 12 at one time. Um, and really the goal is to try and reduce that down as health improves. But obviously the supplements can be really supportive for addressing these functional imbalances, giving the system what it needs um, and you know, allowing the body to, to help itself move forward. And then eventually over time, we start to kind of tweak and chop and change that. So the supplements I recommended uh, was something called, well, NAC is first of all a precursor to glutathione. So I recommended um, a, a type of NAC called augmented NAC, which has recently been shown to help with denaturing the, the spike protein in COVID. Um, so there are some studies now looking at that. Uh, so it's a specific type of, of N-acetylcysteine, uh, which as I say, will help with that glutathione production, which we need a higher demand of, but also will help with that SARS-CoV-2 virus if there's anything laying there within the system. Um, the magnesium 3 and 8 so is a specific type of magnesium which crosses the blood, like, blood brain barrier and can help with supporting cognition. Um, so I've recommended that. Um, a methyl B complex, which also includes B12 based on the fact that he had a plant-based diet as well. Um, probiotics we've addressed for dysbiosis. So I recommend four strains. 10 billion colony forming units in a liquid based formula um, for 12 weeks, some digestive enzymes for really looking at that and supporting that breakdown of his nutrients for those malabsorption factors. Um, and then an adaptogen. So an adaptogen obviously being a herbal compound that can really help to support your body's natural stress response um, in really counterbalancing anything that's dysregulated. Uh, so we've gone for ashwagandha KSM 66, um, also, when our adrenals are under specific stress, we turn over and use and demand a lot more vitamin C. So that was also the case for why I went in with a vitamin C um, as well. Um, then for the fact that he had that damage to his cellular membranes, um, I recommended something called phosphatidylcholine, which is a type of fat um, which essentially is within our cell membranes. So it's a, it's a liquid. Um, and you take it daily and it can really help to support the integrity of your cells through basically bolstering the barrier of those membranes. Um, we also went in with a vegan uh, omega-3, so EPA and DHA, uh, for really helping to counter that inflammatory load, supporting brain health. We know obviously 60% of the brain is made up of fat um, and the fact that obviously he is on a plant-based diet, he's not eating oily fish, I thought that would be a really fantastic addition. Um, a little tincture with some manganese um, to support that. Again, there was a cellular need for that within his Krebs cycle. And some liposomal curcumin, uh, which is obviously the compound we see in turmeric, to really help to um, ad address and reduce the chronic inflammatory load that we're seeing within this picture. So I thought all of these were a really fantastic starting point with his supplements to really help address those various levels um, that were imbalanced. In terms of his nutrition, um, we lowered his refined sugars. Uh, we really lowered his ultra processed foods. Um, it wasn't an easy journey with him because he had a lot of a bit of a um, 
how should I say, a bit of a tortured relationship with food, um, and especially with his ill health. I think he was kind of turning to food as a comfort. So we worked on, you know, his relationship with food and how we could really support balancing his blood sugar by eating three meals a day, looking at increasing his protein intake. So it was kind of slow starting points, but we managed to get there in the end. Um, so increasing protein and also staying mindful of how his eating impacts his energy status. Because a key question I always ask clients with CFS is, how does eating make you feel? Do you feel better when you eat a meal or do you feel worse? If you feel better, that's an indication that you're hypoglycemic. If you feel worse after eating, potentially hyperglycemic. So these give us really good like insights into how, you know, potentially what could be going on with the blood sugar in terms of energy status. Um, switching up gla uh, grains to being gluten-free just where possible, uh, not being totalitarian on it, but really working on that inflammatory load. So things like buckwheat, quinoa, oats, trying to get those types of grains into the diet rather than constantly having pastas, uh, wheat pastas, for example. Um, also chewing food sufficiently. I thought that was a really key facet um, for the malabsorption because he kind of used to, he explained to me he would shovel down his food a lot. Um, so we worked on really making mealtimes a ritual, you know, sitting down, avoiding any tech, and just being at one with the meal and just making it a pleasurable experience where he can focus on how he feels, he can focus on like the nutrient compositions. We talked about how he can build balanced plates and thinking about you know having half of your plate of non-starchy vegetables, lots of color, um, and also elements like thinking about how he can incorporate dietary diversity as well. So you know really incorporating as much diversity and rotation to support fiber. Uh, so we know that you know a healthy gut thrives off diversity and the more we can get different types of plants in our diet the more we can feed these different beneficial communities of microbes that live within our digestive tract so i said to him you know when you're at the supermarket or when your wife's doing the food shop try and think two new plants a week so if you've eaten broccoli last week let's try cauliflower this week and just keep yourself accountable for eating new things new varieties and not being a creature of habit i know we can all tend to sometimes be creatures of habit when it comes to our diet, but just trying to keep yourself accountable for new meals and obviously enlisting support where he can in the form of his wife and his, his son helping to, to cut meals for him when he was, especially when he was feeling um, like he didn't have the energy to do it. Um, we talked about fermented foods, um, again, from, you know, supporting um, his gut. Um, so one to two tablespoons daily, uh, we talked about sauerkraut and kimchi and miso, so finding the foods he liked the best um, and trying to get those fermented foods in. Um, Sulfur-rich foods as well to support his body's endogenous glutathione production. Uh, so things like broccoli, onions, garlic, and a cup of green leafies a day also kind of suggested as a really good shout because they have your fatigue-fighting nutrients in there, magnesium, iron, um, folate, for example. Um, and looking at plant-based iron sources, um, cooking with anti-inflammatory herbs and spices where possible. So adding ginger and turmeric all fresh into his dishes um, and really increasing fluid intake. He wasn't drinking enough water. So that was also something we worked to address uh, to try and get enough fluid intake into his uh, system as well. So that was kind of the nutritional pointers. Um, the other element that's really, really key when working with CFS clients is pacing. So pacing is essentially an energy management strategy that seeks to find the balance between activity and rest. So it's about, for a time, staying and living within the limits imposed by the illness, only for a period though, but allowing yourself to, basically you're avoiding physical and mental activities that exacerbate symptoms, that's the key. You're trying to avoid the triggers. Um, and really it's about avoiding what we see in this um, diagram here which is from my book. So it's it's basically looking at this boom and bust cycle. And I mean, Richard was in this quite a lot. And it was, you know, it was a tough slog trying to get him to kind of relearn his rhythm and um, to really essentially find his baseline. His base, your baseline is a level of activity, whether that's physical, whether that's mental or both, that you can comfortably manage on at least three or four consecutive days without experiencing symptoms as a result. So what we see in a boom and bust cycle is, let's say you have a good day or Richard has a better day. 
he's got higher energy levels, he feels like he can accomplish more. So as a result, he thinks, okay, well, I'm gonna go and try a run again, or I'm gonna go try and see my friends, go for a run, and then do some work and do X, Y, Z. So he's over exerted, he's, he's gone past his physical and a mental, it's not always just physical, physical, mental, and cognitive threshold. And as a result of that, you're then met with this cardinal CFS symptom of post-exertional malaise. And that's kind of what we call payback. That's our payback symptom. And then as a result of that, you've got no choice but to experience, to go through prolonged rest to then have a good day. But then when the good day comes, we go back to that cycle. So finding a baseline is about really trying to you know, address and, and what I always ask clients to do is complete an activity diary. So looking at physical tasks, mental, emotional tasks, and seeing, okay, what's energy building, what's energy draining, and what is energy neutral? And really it's about assessing and finding a bit of a pattern of, okay, what, and it can be context dependent, uh, but trying to then figure out how can we tweak that routine? How can we schedule rests between any taxing activities? How can we minimize those non-essential um, you know, tasks that are energy drainers and incorporate a minimum of at least two energy giving tasks I think I wrote each week there, I mean every day. So every day there needs to be something energy, every, energy giving. And really when it comes to pacing, it's an art, not a science. So I always say about that because, you know, I can give the advice, but really it's for him to kind of walk the walk. And, you know, he's the only person living in his body. He's the only person experiencing the feedback from the crashes. So it's really about working with him. Um, and so once he finds that baseline, I always say, try and drop it back by 25%. That's kind of what we say is the 75% rule is essentially staying within 75% of your energy envelope and not stretching above and beyond this, because then you're giving your body this kind of breathing room for energy levels to recoup. Um, so I hope that makes sense on the pacing. As I say, it can be, it's a journey and it's about learning through each ex experience and through each crash, because crashes obviously do happen. It's a natural part of, of dealing with the illness and recovery from the illness, uh, but it's about navigating activity and how can we balance activity and rest so that we can as eventually recoup energy uh, coming back into the system. Um, and then when it comes to one of the other pillars, um, see detox, we talked about non-toxic living, liver support. So. Obviously, he didn't really eat a lot of animal products anyway, but reducing pesticide exposure um, following the Pesticide Action Network guidance, uh, washing his vegetables where he could. He did use a lot of plastic when he used to kind of wrap his food. He used to have plastic Tupperware whenever he left the house. So we switched to glass Tupperware. Um, I also recommended he, because he did have some amalgam fillings. Uh, so there was potentially, you know, a, well, there was a conversation about him potentially exploring the mercury there as a heavy metal again that was part of the picture we saw on the test so it might have been something worth assessing i don't know if he did that but it was a conversation we had um and then reducing his visits to those construction sites so we we stopped those completely and um, we also did some dry skin brushing um and also implemented water filtration systems uh the other recommendations i gave was an acupressure mat uh, for the noise and light sensitivity it just helped him to give a distraction for his nervous system when he was experiencing that um, sensitivity. And also something called the parent technique. So the parent technique is an osteopathic and um, lymphatic drainage approach, and it specializes in dealing with CFS ME cases. And it's a type of a fluorage massage on the back and chest, which helps to kind of drain away toxins from the central nervous system that may be driving what could be going on in the CFS uh, situation. So those were areas that we explored. And then the other kind of element that I'd say is kind of key, key, key part of dealing with CFS cases is mindset, uh, the nervous system and dealing with those crashes, which I touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so first of all, it's understanding that when you're dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome, it is a bit like snakes and ladders. You know, one day they're up, the next they're down. And, you know, you can feel that sometimes it, or clients can feel like it's one step forward, two steps back. Um, and I certainly, obviously, I know that from firsthand experience as well. And really, I talk to clients a lot about the bounce back. So how can a client bounce back following a crash? What are the learnings? What are the take homes for them? So I always say to a client, you know, if you've had a crash, it's fine. It's not about fighting it. And this was kind of a key thing I spoke with Richard about was, you know, not fighting and accepting what is. 
um, and really reframing it as a learning event. So what can we learn from that? What can we learn from that as pacing? How can we redirect our pacing strategy moving forwards? Uh, so there's always positives to take from those, which as I say, we can reframe as a learning event. Um, Working on those achiever patterns, so Richard very much had an A-type personality, there was very much an element of he, I should, I must, I have to, uh, which again was only adding strain to his nervous system. And really what we want to be doing when we're dealing with this, the nervous system is getting it into a recovery state. We want it to be in the most relaxed and restorative state it can be in for uh, recovery to occur, to really support that and not put any blockers in place. So we worked on these elements via things like meditation and um, guided body scan practices obviously asking him to reduce the stress where he could and um, when it came to sleep um we was asking well, i asked him to avoid naps six hours before he was going to bed because he was finding sometimes that he was napping maybe two hours before bedtime which was then dysregulating his sleep cycle um, and eventually reducing the nap durations down to 30 minutes um or less just to avoid that sleep inertia and then we talked about the box breathing method where you inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, um, and so on, hold on and continue. And so that was a really fantastic way for him just to kind of in those moments of stress, just recalibrate his nervous system and, and restore himself. And that was a method he loved and you know, he would use that as a daily practice. Um, and another one that he loved was becoming, I would say it's called become a narrator of your environment. So in a moment of stress or heavy anxiety, and you can do this anywhere. Uh, I asked him to kind of just narrate what he saw. So if you're on a bus, for example, I would say like literally in your head, see what you see. Um, it could be, or say what you see in your head. So it could be lady um, in the red coat or baby in the pram or car, uh, sign that says car insurance. You know, so you kind of saying the things you see and then maybe three things you hear, three things you feel, and you instantly step out of that mind that mental analysis and then into the present moment and it's a really grounding restorative state to be in and then another conversation we had which was very very pertinent was making sure he gave himself permission to rest because obviously he had that time off work a, a sickness time off work but at the same time it was as i said of such a resistance around him doing nothing and when i'd say to him you know we need to really calibrate and, and try and work on this this rest but you allowing yourself to rest because doing the rest and not and not feeling calm doing it is kind of a disconnect it's not congruent so we talked about him you know doing nothing is productive um and that was a really great reframe for him because i think eventually he allowed himself to accept the situation and and allow that rest um, and once progress becomes evident you know it's all about when we start to then int introduce um activity or whether you call it activity or exercise again, then it was about healing his relationship to exercise, challenging his limiting beliefs. So what hurt you before might not hurt you now, because obviously when we're pacing, we're dealing with uh, CFS, it's quite common that we see, um, you know, this fear of exercise when energy does come back in and energy does become in the conversation again, uh, sorry, exercise comes back in the conversation again. Um, and we start to see this kind of fear, oh, well, what if I crash? You know, I don't think I'm capable. And obviously it's about doing this very, very slowly, very gently, but always going at the body's own rhythm because everybody with CFS is different. Uh, it's, this is not graded exercise therapy, um, which was recently stopped on the NHS because it made a lot of patients worse. Um, this is about, you know, once energy does come in is, is we work to then really slowly, you know, increase that activity. But when obviously the body crashed again, we taper that back and then we, we recalibrate and then we move forward again. So that's kind of, it's like a staircase, not a slope, but to kind of gradually go with it. Um, so lastly, I think this is my last slide before we take questions, but just lastly on beliefs, I think beliefs in chronic fatigue syndrome recovery is very, very important. So why is it important to shift mindset, uh, especially in any chronic illness recovery? Well, first of all, a negative mindset set in chronic illness is a natural response to having long-term poor health. But that being said, negative thought cycles can perpetuate that fight or flight mechanism, 
which can exacerbate symptoms. Obviously, we've seen in his adrenal stress profile, stress, low stress resiliency is part of that mix. So the aim is to facilitate the body into this healing state. So we explored elements um, with through journaling, uh, looking at automatic negative thoughts. I call them little tiny ants in the brain. Um, and we'd label them as kind of chronic illness thoughts. So whether it was CFS goggles, if he was viewing the world through a chronic illness lens, um, let's say he's watched a documentary on Africa um, and then he starts to kind of um, you know, spiral thinking, oh, well, I'd love to go, to, I'd love to go to Africa. Oh, but I won't be able to because of my health. And you, you're looking then at everything through a chronic illness lens, which only narrows your world. And again, puts you in this kind of defeated place. So it's about noticing, observing, and then considering ways to reframe. Uh, things like mind whizzing, which is where it's not necessarily the, the, the actual thoughts themselves, but the speed of which you're having them. So you're having lots and lots of different thoughts, lots of analysis going on, almost like a blender. Um, mental ping pong, which is where you kind of this tennis match conversation with yourself back and forth. Snowballing, where is maybe we wake up and we're filtering for symptoms and a symptom rears its ugly head again. And then the whole day is ruined and we start to spiral. Um, inner critic is where we just always constantly hard on ourselves and perfectionism. That's a very common one to do in CFS recovery, because sometimes we can try very hard to recover. We try to think there is this right or wrong formula that we need to do in specific steps. And this is the way, it's this way or the highway. And if I don't do it like this, I won't recover. Um, so those are elements that are really you know, key that we explored. Um, useful mantra, we also talked about tapping as well through emotional, negative emotional states. And some useful mantras, uh, which I gave him was, first of all, it's your capacity that's changed just for now, not your capability. And that helped Richard to accept his situation for the time being, and it doesn't mean to say that he will stay that way forever. So it's, I th he found that really, really powerful for understanding that actually, yeah, like it doesn't mean that I can't run um, or I'm not capable of running. It just means right now my capacity is a bit stretched. So actually, you know, that was a really useful way of him thinking about the situation. Because sometimes people think, oh, well, I'm not able to do those things anymore and it's forever and, and that I'm not capable. And, and it can be really, it can really affect somebody's self-esteem. It really bruises the ego. So just understanding, actually, no, it's just your capacity, your capacity that's been stretched recently. Um, but you are capable of those things that you were doing before that. And you will certainly be able to get to that place. Um, and I always say, inspire yourself forwards, but measure yourself backwards. So looking how far Richard has come um, and, you know, looking backwards, but keep going forwards, building that evidence of recovery. So the fact that every step that we took forward, we were able to celebrate as many wins and we were able to keep moving forwards, even though there was this kind of, you know, there were crashes along the way and there were, you know, the hurdles. We were able to still keep going forwards and seeing actually, you know, we do have those mini wins that we've moved. You know, if I can get if I've got there before, I can get there again. Um, and also that very famous mantra, this too shall pass is also very, very, very important. And that was very useful for Richard. So 12 weeks later, um, after obviously we did the testing, we've implemented the protocol. We had a few hurdles, as I said, crashes along the way, which is commonplace, very normal in CFS, but now back at work part-time, hoping to move to full-time early next year. And um, he's no longer experiencing that kind of up and down boom and bust cycle. Uh, his body's becoming much more tolerant, tolerant of activity again, and his cognition is also improving. And he's managed to get to three miles runs once a week, uh, which is amazing. And he's looking to taper off, obviously, as I said before, the supplements, because he was on a lot of them, uh, moving forwards as a sign of progress. And then we were also exploring the conversation about retesting in 24, uh, 2024, just to review his progress on those results. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of an overview. That is me. Thank you so much for listening.